today's webinar. Uh, I want to welcome all of you to this 30th episode of the NERFS webinar series on peace and sustainability nexus in the context of global change. So thank you for taking the time uh, to join us today. I am uh, Sharifi, professor at Hiroshima University, and I will be uh, your moderator for this webinar. If this is uh, your first time joining the webinar, the Network for Educational Research on Peace and Sustainability, NERFS, is an international network of educators, researchers, and practitioners uh, collaborating towards the advancement of peaceful and sustainable societies amidst global challenges. So today uh, we have in-person presentation, of course, and it's also recorded as a webinar. And the theme is the challenges of sustainability and non-financial reporting. And we have the uh, honor to have Dr. Teresa Eugenio from Polytechnic of Leria with us today. I've been trying to pronounce the <laughs> names correctly. Uh, so before we start, I want to give you some uh, housekeeping reminders. This webinar is being uh, recorded and will be shared on our social uh, media following the event. If you have questions or comments, you can type them in the uh, chat box or in the Q&A uh, Q box at the bottom of the screen anytime during the uh, webinar. Please just make sure to mention your name and also your uh, affiliation when adding your comments. We expect that the talk will uh, uh, run for about 30 minutes. And after that, we'll have enough time for uh, comments and discussions. Now I'd like to briefly introduce our uh, speaker, Professor uh, Eugenio. Uh, she received her postdoctorate in management and holds a PhD in uh, management specialization in accounting. She is a tenure associate professor in the Department of Management and Economics at Polytechnic University of Leria, Portugal, where she has uh, held various management positions, such as department coordinator, coordinator of the degree in accounting and finance, and member of various scientific uh, pedagogical committees. She is an ambassador for the SDG Alliance in education, and she is vice coordinator and integrated member of uh, CARME, Center for Applied Research in Management and Economics. She is also a member of the Order of Certified Accountants and of Chartered Accountants. Her research interests include social and environmental accounting, sustainable development goals, non-financial reporting information, sustainability education, and auditing. Uh, she has published several books and papers in academic journals, including the Sustainability Accounting Management and Policy Journal, the Managerial Audit Auditing Journal, and also the Journal of Business Ethics, among uh, many other journals. So with that, I would like to uh, give the microphone to Professor Eugenio. Thank you very much for joining us today. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here in this webinar uh, for that. It's a pleasure to me to be in the Yoroshima University. So uh, the topic of today uh, is about sustainability and uh, non-financial information for the companies. So the challenges of sustainability and non-financial uh, reporting. So the idea is just to discuss a little bit uh, about this concern. Uh, what companies uh, are um, suggested or uh, voluntary or mandatory uh, need to do uh, in this context in the uh, non-financial reporting? Um, and I, I will talk a little bit more what is going on in Europe and also in Portugal, of course, not in detail, but uh, just some, uh, some ideas. Uh, because I'm not sure about exactly what you know about this topic, I go to begin with uh, some, uh, two or three um, ideas in the introduction of this uh, question. Corporate social responsibility and how is it important in the companies? In fact, during several years, the main idea uh, is that companies must have profits uh, and that's it. Okay. And of course, it's important. Companies must have profit because they, they, they need to survive 
uh, in the uh, in the environmental they need to pay the, the the salaries they need to pay all the bills but there are other responsibilities that the companies should not forget so the idea is that the companies could introduce in their making decision the triple uh, bottom line or the three p's so not only the profit the economic pillar but also the planet so the environmental pillar and the people, the social pillar. So the idea is that in all the decisions, if possible, uh, a company also introduce the other uh, questions. What about the impact of this decision uh, on the environment? And what about the impact of this decision in the social issues? Mm -hmm. So uh, the sustainability, in fact, is intersection of the, the, three, uh, the three pillars. And of course, the, the uh, uh, several years, and because nowadays the communication is very, very fast, so it's uh, completely possible to know what is going on in Japan if I am in Portugal, or what is going on in Philippines if I am in USA, and so on. It's important the companies do the right things, and many times. Um, many NGOs and other organizations seems that companies are not doing the, the right things. Of course, many companies do, okay? <laughs> we know that, that many companies really do a very good job, of course, but there are others that probably are not so carried about these questions. And it's important that all the companies are um, um, in this uh, in this. Way. So, uh, just uh, another another idea. I'm not sure if you know this, this man, probably yes. Uh, I like very much his ideas. Muhammad Yunus was the Nobel Prize um, uh, winner in, uh, I suppose, 2006. He's from Bangladesh. Uh, he took uh, take uh, uh, a PhD in the USA. Um, he's uh, an, you know, he's, uh, uh, an economist. Um, and he, he already published several books. One of them is this one, Creating the World Without Poverty. So, when I wrote, uh, read uh, the, uh, the, his books, for me it was really impressive because he really believes that it's possible a world without poverty, and we can work together. We can work all together. Uh, also, the, the the companies, the academics, the students, the civil population, so all together. Um, <clears throat> He talks uh, a lot about microcredit, but many other ideas for the companies could be more social responsibility. So it's just an idea if you want to uh, also to, to know more about him, if you don't know him. In fact, he was in Portugal this year, this year, no, last year. Uh, last year, so for me, it was a pleasure to, to went to the conference when, uh, where he was and speak with him. It was very, 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 very special. Uh, there is also a link <clears throat> uh, with the uh, news about that. And in that time, uh, Professor Mohamed Nunoz told us about the theory of three zeros. So for him, it's really important that in the world, we have zero unemployment, uh, zero uh, climate changes, uh, and zero concentration of the, the, the rich. And they talk a little bit about each zero, about this theory. And he said uh, his dream is that all the young people could be um, teenagers or young uh, with the three zero theory. I think it's really interesting. So I invited you to, to know a little bit more about it. So now, uh, just a little bit about the evolution from work and reporting practices. So in fact, if we look some, some years ago, the companies must disclosure financial information. So it was what is uh, requested for the companies. Um, well, I put this, uh, these dates. It was from the context of Portugal. Of course, the probably in other countries was not exactly that, that years, but it is just an evolution for we have um, an idea of what is going on in the mandatory information uh, that must be disclosed by the different companies. Uh, after uh, not only the financial statements, but companies are requested also to make a management commentary, governments and uh, say something about their governance and remuneration policies, and also uh, some ideas about the environmental impacts that company have. After that, um, we, oh, it oh, was an evolution, not just environmental reporting, but also sustainability reporting. It means that also the social pillar was included. So 
and the companies are invited also to disclose something about what they are doing, some practices and some activities that also includes the social appeal. Uh, then what is going on uh, in the recent time is that uh, companies could do an integrated report. It means that they do, they could be do all together or not. I don't know how to explain it, but uh, they must join all the information. Okay, and uh, that is really important that the financial statements are not the um, the biggest uh, and the only point to be focused. Focus it, but also uh, governance and remuneration, sustainable information, and management commentary. So we have integrated information. And what we realize, or what I realize since our research on this topic, is that in fact companies publish environmental and social information for a different purpose. So many times companies decided to take an environmental management system, some certification. For example, the ISO um, for uh, 40,000 RAN or EMASH or another environmental management system. So they have to adequate many policies and many uh, practices inside the company to answer to all the calls to have that certification. And this is a way where a company begins to produce environmental information, for example. Other times, um, for example, in Portugal, we have uh, science a long time. Uh, we have uh, an accounting um, standard that talks about uh, environmental issues. So it says that companies must include in their annual reports. So every year they have to produce and publish an annual report. They have to introduce some environmental information. So accountants begins also to produce some environmental uh, information to answer to this uh, to this call to this um, uh, accounting accounting standard that, that accounting standard uh, um, it have it's based in a, a european union recommendation i'm not sure if you are from accounting perhaps not <laughs> but uh, we have a lot of standards in accounting especially in financial accounting and um, there is an um, organization, international organization, uh, EFRS Foundation, EFRS, now it's foundation, but that published all the standards, international standards. Nowadays, for the majority of the countries, especially the, the companies that are in stock markets, have to follow that, uh, that guidelines, that uh, international accounting and financial reporting standards. Uh, and the, the, what is happening now is that uh, many countries have their own accounting standards based majority based in that international accountants that the majority of the companies should use and then the stock market companies use the international level but i, I hope it is not so uh, um, complicated complex well in another in another way companies also produce uh, information about sustainability uh, issues, social and environmental, because they want to publish a sustainability report. And uh, in many countries, it's still voluntary uh, uh, report. So uh, this one, it's not voluntary. And while report is not voluntary, it's mandatory, okay? This environmental management system is voluntary because companies want to have some certification that says to the stakeholders, they are really interested in being more uh, sustainable. Um, and the sustainability report in many countries not all, I got to speak a little about it also, um, do it in a voluntary basis. So they decided to follow some guidelines, for example, the GREE standards or the, the, um, the proposed uh, um, uh, directives, directives from the IRRC or FRAG or EFRS also have some guidelines. So they follow the guidelines they think they are more interesting for them and produce a uh, sustainability report. Sometimes they do it uh, in the majority of the times until now, or until five years ago or so on, and they produce in a different report. So they have the annual accounts, the annual report, and the sustainability report separated. Nowadays, many companies join and put all together in an integrated report. Um, so, in fact, there are already there are already some um, guidelines that company can follow to make a, a report of 
what we call by non-financial information. When I use this expression because it is not a consensus. Some, some, don't, some people don't agree with non-financial information, but in fact, in my topic in accounting, we, we, we use this expression, okay? Non-financial information to talk about the sustainability topics. So the Global Reporting Initiative, I can say that was the, the, the more adopted uh, framework, if you can do, if you can say framework, um, for, for all the companies. There are a lot of studies about this, and we, when we, we have different samples from different countries, we, we uh, almost all conclude that the majority of the companies that decided to, to make a sustainable report do it according to these uh, guidelines, to these standards. Now, in fact, the green was moved to standards. In my opinion, well, it's my opinion, but I think it's uh, um, it's also a, a good development um, standards because it begins, I suppose, in uh, 2000, and uh, with the multi-stakeholder panels, they were also improving it. So they are a very open organization. They receive some suggestions from from different uh, stakeholders, from different players. They try to improve the indicators, the the way how to do the indicators. So I think uh, it's, uh, in fact, it's a, a, good, uh, uh, a good way of doing the things. Well, it's why probably that the majority of the, the companies uh, choose uh, that one. So it's a global independent organization that develops a worldwide framework of reporting guidelines, enabling companies to prepare uh, reports on their economic performance. Economic, but uh, here it's in a long term, economic, social, and environment. So there is a little bit about, about the standards, but I, I go to, to pass just to show you some indicators. So how it is organized. Uh, so there are different indicators. They also have uh, sector um, standards because there are sectors that are more specific. So they also have, they create it also what, uh, what we can see here. They also create um, degree uh, sector standards which apply to specific sectors. But they have the universal standards, which apply to all organizations, and thematic standards, uh, which present the content uh, relevant to a particular team. So this is just uh, um, an example. If you are interested in this topic, or probably I don't know if you, if you perhaps you know more about me, <laughs> you know more than me about this. I'm not sure. Um, but there is uh, many examples that you can find in the web. Uh, of different, especially big companies that already do it. So for example, economic, we have different indicators like economic performance, market presence, presence indirect economic impact, for example, environmental materials, energy, biodiversity, emissions. Uh, and inside this, for example, energy, there are many other topics, okay? So uh, energy, uh, renewable energy or wind energy or solar energy, and try that companies disclose uh, some indicators are in Eros or Yens, because we are in Japan, in the monetary unit, but other uh, indicators are not in monetary unit. Could be um, if, if it was energy or water, for example, liters, or it depends on what we are talking about. Okay. Um, and social, there are a lot of them. So, for example, uh, employment, labor management relations, training and education, diversity and equal opportunities, and many others. So, we have here uh, 18, okay, but uh, inside each one, there are uh, uh, detailed um, indicators. Well, so this is the degree proposed, very, very, uh, <laughs> not in detail, so just a, a small idea. Um, after the degree, I'm not sure, but probably near 2010, it appears another organization and another uh, proposal that is uh, integrated reporting. It is called exactly that. This is a proposal uh, for uh, international reporting framework. We have here the link. So the idea is that the company can tell a story of their sustainability actions. So a lot of story, okay? They, they should uh, make a narrative for their stakeholders about what they are doing. And this proposal uh, have different capitals. So the company can talk about the natural capital, the, um, the human capital, uh, the um, uh, intellectual capital, and so on. Okay, there are different capitals that the company should talk about and, uh, and, um, and use it to tell the story to the stakeholders.
I have to confess that in Portugal, not many companies uh, goes on this on this idea, right? But I think overall, it's probably not so many, but some do it because, in fact, there is. Uh, they can choose what they want to to report uh, according to one standard they they want they want to choose. It was is going on, and in fact, uh, in the recent years, many other partners joined in this uh, in this dialogue. So, uh, besides uh, the global reporting initiative um, and the ERC, we have others <laughs> like uh, uh, CBP driving sustainable economies. Uh, also, EF, uh, EFRS Foundation, IFAC, International Federation of Accountants, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, World Business Council for Sustainable Development. So, there are collaborating organizations, new organizations that get in this uh, topic, get in this dialogue for all together try to build something. In, in some parts, I, I, I feel, and I think that also companies feel, there are so many options that sometimes it gets a little bit confused. So, um, but before I, I talk about regulation, just another another topic. Um, this in here, uh, in next conferences, and in fact, I went to two conferences for the symposium of sustainable development and higher education that was last week on Monday and Tuesday. And then I have a great opportunity also to attend the next conference about peace and sustainability. And many delegates talk about sustainable development goals. So I know it's not a new topic for you. But the, the idea was um, also to uh, put this in annual reports or in the sustainability reports. So the companies are also invited to try to, to think about how they can achieve to the sustainable development goals. And the idea, of course, is not the companies can achieve to all. It depends on uh, in which sector the companies are operating. But if they can, they can choose, for example, they say, well, uh, because we are in this sector, we, in fact, have a lot of activities that promote uh, the uh, um, uh, SDG number 11, sustainable cities and communities. So we do this, this, and that. And we also, uh, uh, we also uh, are worried about life below the water. So we also do this, this, and that. And well, or, or if they don't do nothing yet, perhaps they can think about what they can do to also try to achieve some of these uh, of these goals. Um, in in uh, different studies, for example, this one, we also went to the um, uh, sustainability reports or annual reports to try to understand what companies are already uh, doing. Uh, because, well, you know, the research field is so, so large, it's, it's possible for you to, to research different topics. And I and my students, the students that I supervise for masters or PhDs, we try to, to look in different aspects of this discussion. But for example, this work, it was in the beginning, it was done in uh, 19, uh, 2017, and the uh, SDGs was published in 2050, uh, two, two years before. So we went to we choose just the sector uh, of water drinks because the student works in this uh, in this sector, so she she has uh, curiosity to know what is going on. Um, and for example, for this one, we we analyze different companies, but nationally, uh, we try to to match well uh, uh, from what they say they do. Uh, in fact, uh, which uh, SDGs was uh, included because in that time they don't say nothing about it yet. So it was, um, it was, it could be the first step, but we also now uh, can find other examples. This one is from one company that perhaps you, you know, from Petro, Galp, which operates in Portugal. And um, this is a picture from the sustainability report from Galp, this company. And they, they try to show to the stakeholders <laughs> Uh, the uh, SDGs that are more material, what are what in fact they think they have more impact. Um, other SDGs that are directly connected with their activity, and also they also find here some uh, SDGs that are not so uh, direct, but uh, they have an indirect action, and they they put bigger or smaller the SDGs for uh, which one they contribute. So it is just to show that is another topic very important now that must be included in the non-financial information reporting uh, from the companies. I have the opportunity to start to, to, to Ginev. 
uh, in Switzerland uh, in 2015, exactly, it was in November. Um, I was there because the, um, I also met some work with the Chartered, uh, with the Order of Certificated Accountants. So she, they invited me because I researching this topic to go with them. It was a really good experience. And in that time, the, the gold was published uh, two months before the conference. And uh, uh, they invited many countries, as they usually do in the United Nations. Uh, the, the, there are the representatives of the professional orders regarding to accounting and auditing. And we discuss uh, a document that um, uh, exactly promotes the introduction of this topic in the sustainability, in corporate, social, in corporate financial reporting. In fact, is what they want to do is that all countries can go to return to their countries with this idea. Um, companies must introduce sustainable development goals in their reports. For me, it was new because I didn't know if they were just published two, two months before and I didn't uh, know nothing about it. Um, but I, I realized that there are um, many um, ideas and uh, uh, there are also probably strong um, um, impact from uh, organizations like United Nations uh, for all countries can apply it uh, uh, inside uh, in national level. Well, so all of that uh, that is happening uh, um, begin another discussion. So it should continue to be voluntary or mandatory. Some countries, uh, not so many in uh, some years ago, uh, do it as a voluntary way. Others do it uh, the majority. Others, it's mandatory, just a few. Uh, the companies have uh, uh, no standard, uh, just one standard to follow. So some companies decided to follow GREE, others decided to follow uh, EERC, but there are many other things that I won't say it today, but there are many other options. So when they want to compare information, it's not easy. Uh, when they want to know if the company is disclosing everything, it's not easy because it can just choose the standards. There are more uh, advantage that they can take more advantage. And there is also another question that is the assurance. Because um, there are a lot of calls that these reports must be, uh, must be audited uh, from uh, an independent party. Uh, because as we know, companies of course like to disclose positive information, but many times they also have negative information to disclose and they don't disclose that because it's not so nice to the stakeholders. So sometimes they just put the negative impacts uh, behind and just disclose the positive ones. But it's important and the idea is that we could disclose everything and that, that information could be auditing. So the discussion begins about the regulation. It's not also a new discussion. You can find different papers discussing these. It must be mandatory, it must be voluntary based as well. What I realize now that we are in a life, especially in Europe, to regulate this question. Because sometimes the companies, the good companies already do it, but the ones that need more don't want to talk about it. And if it's not mandatory, they just don't do it. And that's okay. So now we have uh, assists to uh, um, many, many regulations. Um, well, I can talk a little bit more about my case, okay, about Europe and Portugal. So I'm not sure exactly what is going on in Japan, but perhaps someone here also in the debate can, can share a little bit or in other countries. Um, in uh, Europe, uh, there were some directives, laws and regulations that are coming about this question. For example, uh, well, this one is very old, but uh, it was a recommendation. It was why in Portugal we have that accounting standard of uh, environmental issues that must be included in the annual report. But it's quite simple. It's more quite simple. Well, not it's not exactly that. It's it is just more to measure to um, to disclose in the uh, environmental and the uh, annual report and not uh, so broader. Okay, it's, it is more focused to the companies that have. Uh, 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 big um, negative impacts in the environment, like so some factories or so on. And now the idea is not that just the, the companies with higher impacts in the environment are disclosed, but also the others, because all companies have something they, they can do better for environmental and especially social issues. 
So then we have a directive from 2040. Uh, this directive is was from the European Commission. Um, it, it says that the member states should uh, introduce some uh, um, mandatory disclosure to the companies that are in the stock market. So it, in Portugal, uh, it happened for the first time for the year, uh, if I'm right, 2018, um, for the first year, that the, the companies that are in the stock market, they, they should do it as mandatory. It's not anymore voluntary. So many of them already disclose a sustainable, to revol uh, um, a sustainable to report, but now they must do it as a, a mandatory way. Uh, and now we have a very recent directive. It was from 2022, but in fact, it was published just in December, so almost one year. <laughs> it's uh, almost from 1023, but I go to talk a little bit. So in Portugal, we have this, uh, this two, the, the, that one, as I told you, is uh, from more recent, to introduce mandatory for the uh, companies that are in the stock market. So, well, I think it's not so important to detail what is going on here about this, but I go to focus a little bit on this last uh, directive, because now is the big uh, dialogue that we can assist uh, in Portugal and in other European countries. So, uh, this directive that was published for the European Parliament uh, and the Council, um, amending regulations that were already published in regard to corporate sustainability reporting, um, and uh, which will profoundly change sustainability reporting, making this type of reporting mandatory for all large companies and listed small and medium sized companies from 2025 onwards. So it means that they are going to get broader the number of companies that must disclose this kind of information. So in the first step is the big ones. Um, the, who are the big ones? Uh, all the companies that have more than 500 employees uh, that should um, do it as a mandatory, okay? In fact, this is beginning um, from um, 2025. Uh, but uh, regarding uh, this year, 2024, okay? So now all companies are, the ones that don't do yet are uh, worried about it because they need to begin this way. Uh, just for you have an idea, uh, with the publication of this directive for the first time, the aim is to bring companies sustainable reporting into line with their financial reporting. It is estimated that around uh, 50,000 companies will have to apply, uh, just European, okay, um, will have to comply with the, rule, the rules introduced by this new directive. In context, to the uh, 12,000 companies that were covered by the previous non-financial reporting directives. The previous one uh, was, for example, the directive from 2014 that makes the stock market companies uh, for that mandatory. So now we have a bigger, uh, a bigger number. And the European Commission uh, um, has also proposed the development of specific standards uh, so that non-listed uh, uh, small and medium size uh, companies can voluntarily disclose this type of information appropriate to their structure and capacity in order to make it easier for them to report to their stakeholders. So financial institutions, investors, coms, uh, um, customers, and other interested parts. So I think, and we think that probably now it's mandatory for the big ones, but the idea that is, um, uh, in, uh, that, is uh, that we can see is that it could be uh, for many, many, many other, other companies. And uh, uh, there are also some uh, uh, documents very interesting to help uh, also medium and uh, medium, uh, small and medium sized companies also to join this way and also to begin to report. For example, um, I'm from Maria, as uh, Professor Ayotzi. Ayotzi, how much time? You have uh, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I live in Maria, is a, is a city in the, uh, in the center of Portugal. Uh, we have a lot of industries uh, surrounded, but not big companies. There are medium and some small size companies, but they are very import, important for our country. Uh, and they also begin to come to the academic uh, to, to, to ask us, well, help us how we can also do something about the, the sustainability report and how we can improve our uh, strategies to also um, involve uh, this, this question. 
So in Portugal, in fact, uh, there are, we are now working on that directive and um, the time that, uh, well, is in the, uh, in, the, in the calendar is June of this year to, to have a national law. Because the idea is that the, the, the directive um, says something, in this case mandatory, because sometimes there are guidelines for the state members, but it's not the case. In this case, the state members have to introduce in their national level by any law, okay? Uh, so it, the law is make, I, I hope now they are making the, that law and that it will be published uh, in June uh, 2024. So this year, it was what is planned. Um, so, uh, so some some differences that came from this directive uh, is the, of course, the, the, to be mandatory for the big ones. Uh, they also talk about the digitalization. Okay, and um, they also talk about the dates. Okay, there are diff different dates. Um, so, and this is the, the, the last one. Of course, I don't go to detail here the directive, but if you want to read it, I think it's interesting because there are a lot of details and many recommendations for, for the companies. They also talk about the topics, uh, but um, about the topics, uh, they say that uh, there, there should be um, just one, one unique standard. So the companies follow the same, okay? Not uh, so um, uh, different standards, but apply the same standards. So now they are uh, working on uh, uh, a plan, okay? So um, IFRAD was the, the, the organization that becomes responsible to make the European standards. I feel like I can, I can say that way, right, okay? So the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, EFRAD, and the, uh, the, this directive, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, EFRAD <coughs> will standardize uh, non-financial reporting disclosure compliant, uh, compliance sustainability reporting standards, okay? So the idea is that organization begin to disclose standards. I have to confess that uh, probably companies that already do said, well, but we have to change everything, but we already have something done. We already followed the Greek guidelines. Why we have to change now everything? Because it was a big excuse to begin to publish and to produce all this information. So it wasn't not, not um, an easy, an easy talk, okay? But I think they, they also um, understand that and they, they try to join different partners in this discussion, okay? And well, I'm not sure what the, the final thing, okay? Because this is in building, this is building yet, okay? It is not, we don't have the final documents, but uh, this is just drafts. Uh, and for example, here are the, the drafts, what they, they intend, and they are in the web page of the FRAG. You also, you, you already can see the drafts about uh, general norms, environmental, social, and governance. And for example, from environmental, the climate change, pollution, uh, water and uh, marine resources, biodiversity of, and ecosystems, uh, the use of resources and circular economy, and social workers of the entity, workers in the um, value shared communities, um, uh, consumers and uh, last uh, users. Okay, so I think they are working together. Okay, they are working together, try to um, to get what we already know and uh, build something that uh, could be um, standardized for all the companies. So here we have the, um, the dates, what they, they intend to do. Okay, a roadmap, a sustainable, um, a corporate sustainable reporting disclosure roadmap, a directive roadmap. And the last, um, the last thing is assurance deadlines. So. Uh, now they are also working this question, assurance auditing. Uh, they are also working on new uh, standards for the auditing profession, uh, how they can auditing in, um, uh, in the same way, okay? And with the special rules for that. So in fact, we are assisting now uh, to many uh, transformative things and uh, to, well, I think to many big steps, I hope, I hope. Um, so there are some links if you are interested to know a little bit more about it. Um, and uh, I just finish here with um, uh, with this question, with this um, 
for me was really important and uh, I feel happy. When I saw in Portugal, and I think the Portugal is not the only case, probably it's happened in many other European countries and probably not European, but all, all, all in all the, um, the, the world. Um, it, because we, in Portugal, we have uh, uh, two professional orders. So OCC, it's uh, the order of certificated accountants. And we have the, the order of uh, auditing of the chartered accountants. Okay. And we have uh, uh, SMC, it's the Commission for the Standardization uh, Accounting Standards. So it's the uh, CNC is the like the boss. <laughs> they publish the standards that must be applied by the certificated accountants and the, the chartered auditors or accountants. Um, and sometimes this dialogue is not easy. This, Three organizations is important. They talk together, they are open, and they can join and they can build something together. Sometimes it's not easy. And uh, it, uh, about this topic, it never happens, but it happens now. So uh, two years ago, uh, I saw a conference and I was there about sustainability and non-financial reporting that joined the three organizations in Portugal. So I think that was a big step because. Uh, that orders are now carried about this topic and are now promoting this topic for the professional, um, for all the professionals, uh, for the professional job. So I think it was a very, for me, for me and for all that cares about this, uh, uh, interesting. So thank you so much for your attention. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. <coughs> and um, I hope uh, it was interesting for you. I hope so. Thank you so much. Very much, Professor Eugenio. So we have about 15 minutes for questions and discussions. But before that, I would like to remind you that uh, following this webinar, there will be also another webinar. So uh, if you're interested, uh, please uh, stay and stay home. And I think we'll have a different link for that. So, uh, for online uh, participants, if you're interested, please check the DARS website. Yes, so thank you for the very insightful uh, presentation. And it's good to know that uh, we have having some standards for uh, making uh, financial reporting more aligned with sustainability. And that's very exciting. So we have now uh, time for questions. Are there any questions from the audience here? Yes. Thanks very much for the great presentation. Uh, uh, this is uh, Rohan from the from Hiroshima University. I'm a master's student here. Um, so, so yeah, uh, this used to be my world in the past of financial policy. I've, I've worked a lot on that. So I, I'm kind of curious in terms of the uh, environmental and social aspects. The the disclosures that companies are now required to make. Is is it more on the positive side? Are you what they are doing to maybe to to to, uh, to to kind of promote their environmental impact and social impact, or are they also required to show some of the bad stuff that they do? For example, very simply, if you're an oil company, you know you're, you're digging all out the ground and it's increasing greenhouse gas emissions, etc. So, is is it mainly on the positive aspects, or they are they are expected to to disclose everything? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, in fact, they are requested to, to disclose everything. There is also a part with risks that company should take a uh, long time to think about it. What are the risks the, the activity means to the environmental or to or and to the social issues? So they must disclose the positive aspects, of course, what they are doing, what they can improve, uh, what they can do to improve uh, the um, the less impact in the environment, for example, because we know that sometimes it's, it's difficult to have zero impact. We know that because uh, it's, um, it's a difficult discussion also because nowadays the people want to have everything. We, uh, the consume, uh, we, are, we consume a lot. If we, if, if we look for, for uh, 14 years or 100 years ago, there are no many there are small, um, many number of uh, small number of products, and nowadays we go to everywhere to, to all the shops, and there are so many many uh, products to be sold. Uh, and of course, uh, for that, for the society of that, yeah, it, it has environmental impacts. Um, but the, the idea is just to have less 
possible impact. Uh, but answering your question, um, it is really important that company also disclose the negative aspects and that they uh, think about it, that they have some internal discussion about what we can do. Well, we have these negative impacts. How can we reduce them? Or how can we just avoid them? And they also must disclose about it. Diego. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Very exciting. My name is Prince, and I'm also from the IDEC Institute. Uh, I'm concerned. I, I try to uh, compare what the companies are doing, the challenges that they are likely to face, and what countries are actually facing now. And I, I realized that, uh, for instance, with the voluntary uh, local reviews of the countries when it comes to SDG reports, no sustainability report, how far they are implementing and then the progress and all that. I realized that the company standards have already taken care of some of, some of those challenges. But my issue is about uh, how we will be able to ensure that the companies have legitimate source of baseline data when it comes to reporting uh, progress of, of, of the sustainability activities and the things that they are doing. Because for instance, uh, in developing countries, for instance, realize that uh, access to data and also research and all that is, is very an issue. So have there been any challenge or are, are companies reporting those kind of challenges as to uh, access to legitimate uh, information or baseline data that will help them to report the progress that they are making. Yeah, so that, that's, that's my question. Mm -hmm. Some ideas how companies deal with that. It's what you are uh, asking me. Yeah, so I think uh, it means that uh, <laughs> for sustainability reporting, they may need detailed data, including baseline data. <laughs> And are those data available in all countries and for all mm -hmm. companies? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know to what extent this uh, performance reporting is within the scope of the company, or do they also need to rely on some data outside their own company? Mm -hmm. to do that? Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, now, to build the indicators, um, if you look to a sustainability report, it usually has two parts. The first part is more descriptive. Uh, there are some uh, graphics and pictures, some tables with comments. And in the last part, they have uh, uh, some pages with the indicators. Okay, So they try to answer to the indicators. For example, the green ones, the, the green uh, that I show you, they try to answer to all the indicators and build information to answer to that indicators. And the, in the last pages, they put the index of all the, the indicators. The majority of the information that is required uh, is internal information. So it's, it's information that the company must build. Sometimes companies have difficulty to collect all the information because they need human resources. So sometimes it's expensive because they, they need to have more people working on that to collect all the data. Sometimes it, it is useful to have some software that can help them to also to collect and uh, to uh, have final uh, numbers for uh, the indicators, and it takes time and money. Uh, but usually, the majority of the information is inside the company. Okay. Um, if they want to compare, for example, it could happen. Well, I would like to know. Well, the other companies in my sector, what they are doing, what they are not doing. I would like to learn with the best, uh, the, the best uh, companies in the sector, so they can probably in the developing countries have more difficulties. Uh, because uh, I understand that sometimes information are not so easy to, to, to find. But just answering your question, in fact, the majority of the information, all the information is inside the company. It's about what company do. It's not so uh, important to compare with the other, other things. What could be interesting is just for a um, discussion, an internal discussion of the company and try to make some strategic decisions is to see, for example, well, what about our uh, consumer of water? 
Well, we are consuming that 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 amount of uh, of water. Um, if I compare also to another company in the same sector that produce more or less the same as I produce, and if they are uh, using much less, so perhaps I, I should ask why uh, in my uh, produce process um, I am wasting so much water. Perhaps there are uh, many things that I can do to improve it. And I'm talking about water, but I can talk about energy, about materials, or other questions. Thank you. Diego? Thank you, Mark. My name is Diego, Diego Samudio from Smart uh, Society, PhD student in uh, Franconomics. So, uh, my concerns also related to please because for data. So, because we want to, if we want to uh, uh, evaluate some program or something, so we need some data to, but the high frequency or uh, or also intentions for companies to have this kind of data. So my question is, if, if there are uh, in your experience, uh, they are willing to uh, to take kind of a small programs or pilot programs to have some data in maybe to have some. Uh, uh, agreements or, or join the work with students so they can apply something or some technology that they they maybe they want to expand or to scale and can be benefit in, in in some sdg so maybe narrow the question so if they are willing to cooperate and also uh, to, to do the kind of work and in, in your experience also what which SDG, uh, SDG or some SDG they are interesting more, or maybe it's up to the, you know, in, in Portugal or in Europe, maybe different. I'm from Peru, so South America, it's also difficult to find the information. And companies are not some, I think they are not so interesting to work deep in. Or to have some data because they want to spend money and investment for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I understand that is a concern to the students. How can I find the data to make my my research? In Portugal, we also have that uh, that problem, but uh, nowadays it is being better. So what I mean is that when, uh, uh, for example, ten years ago, it's also uh, almost impossible to find any databases with uh, um, SDGs um, information or S uh, SDGs or uh, um, environmental social governance uh, topics or indicators from companies. Now it's easier. For example, we uh, have a database, uh, but, but GRI was the first was the first databases that I know. I use the database GRI uh, for several, uh, already for several uh, studies with my master's students. Um, uh, in, the, in the beginning, they were free in the website. Now we, you have to ask, but they, they send you an Excel file, very good, <laughs> from all, all, all the world. Um, uh, well, of course, all databases have some limitations. For example, this one, they collect all the data from the sustainable reports published around the world that companies send to them. So it means that the companies that are in the database whose Gree standards, okay, but that, that's that, that is very big, and there are a lot of information there. The sector, the country, uh, the the standards that they apply, uh, if they are insurance or not. Well, many, many, uh, and they have the link to the sustainability report, so it's very nice. Uh, there are other databases, for example, I suppose that uh, Thomson uh, Reuters database that also have financial information. Now it's possible also to have. Uh, social, um, environmental, social governance indicators uh, information. So it's also possible to, to have a lot of information from what is going on in different companies in different uh, uh, countries. And sometimes we also produce our own database. We take more time, but uh, when we want special information that are not in that databases, uh, we just collect manually the sustainability reports, and we already do that. We make our own database uh, in Excel, and then we can use the SPSS or other statistical uh, program to, um, to make our conclusions and to, um, to discuss what we want to, to understand better. Thank you. So just uh, one final question uh, from the online audience. Uh, 
and uh, if possible, please please be very brief, like thirty seconds. Okay, okay. So we have the plan. Uh, so this is from an anonymous attendee, and he or she wants to know if uh, these companies, because you mentioned these issues of zero unemployment and zero concentration of wealth. So the question is that do these uh, directives or do this non-financial reporting also help to achieve those objectives or not? Are they aligned with those or not? I think so. In fact, I, I really think so. Because sometimes people ask me, well, do you think that companies just do it because it's uh, marketing interesting or because of the image or because they, they want to show they just do the right things? Or in fact, they are interested in both. It's a difficult question. <laughs> I think both. Of course, companies are interested in have a, a good image, uh, a good picture, uh, in the marketing purpose. Of course, they are interested in that. But I also believe, and I'm sure, that when they begin to do a sustainability report, and when they begin to try to collect all the non-financial information, they must do an internal discussion. And I think it's good. That it's good because they have to sit in the same table, people from the accounting department, law department, uh, human resources department, production department, quality department, and they are they must be all together discussing this. In the majority of the times, of course, that sometimes they just contract a consultant, a big consultant company that does something uh, well, but this is I think it's not the majority of the cases. So um, I, I really think that uh, we have a big profit <laughs> when the companies begin this way. Probably some uh, with more impact than others, but I, I'm sure they contribute to the shift of these uh, uh, zero employment, uh, zero concentration of, of uh, rich and um, climate changes. But we have to, we need more steps, of course. We need really more engagement, okay? Uh, there are a lot of things to do yet. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I, I know there is a lot of interest, but in the interest of time, we have to close the session soon. So with that, please uh, give Professor, Professor Eugenio a chance. On behalf of our directors, I would like to uh, thank you by offering this certificate of appreciation. Thank you very much for uh, giving this insightful talk. What is from NERS? from Professor Kaneko. From our team, Professor Shiashi. Once again, thank you very much. I'm not sure if I'm to come to the front, because we can have a group photo.